This is a follow-up video on the global exception handling. We'll finish up the validation exception handling using Fluent Validation. I'll show you how to create your own custom validators. And then I'll show you how to reuse those validators in both the backend as in the frontend. I'll make sure to leave a link in the description about the previous video that covered global exception handling. Let's get started. I'll start by adding Fluent Validation to my API project. And I'll create a new custom exception. Call it validation exception. I'll make sure to inherit from exception and resolve this. We should now be able to resolve the errors. Yep, it automatically resolved. Make sure you're using this custom validation exception and not the, the one from the system or something. Okay, so that's all fine. So now we should be able to throw a validation exception, which is more appropriate for this conditional than a not found exception. Let's try it. Um, so you have one from data annotations, you have one from fluent validation, uh, but we should make sure to use our own This expects a validation failure from fluent validation. Let's see. An array of failures. Let's see. from fluent validation that should be new and it expects the error message to be a string like just like that Let's head back over to our validation exception to see how this is formatted. So it's going to pass the one or more validation failures have occurred, occurred, excuse me, to the exception. And then it's creating an empty dictionary of errors in which it will store the failures grouped by property name and then to dictionary. Running that will give us a nice formatted result. One or more validation errors occurred. Status 400 bad request. Errors, the key of the property and the value. Well, we're not really getting the... We're not descriptive enough, not declarative enough about what the condition was that isn't met. So we'd probably want to say property and then our message must be at least 24 hours into the future that's more like it so the next thing would be to get a validation error when we're not passing uh, the correct data so if we're uh, leaving something null that is not nullable or something in the wrong format or yeah, just incorrect values to do that, we can simply go to this request method. I could either do that in the same file of, or create a new file. I'm going to create a new file and call it uh, 
similarly for weather forecast request then validator it's going to inherit from fluent validations abstract validator with the type of the request then we can have a constructor and access the rule for and then I'm gonna call this request since the, that's the request and then we target the property of let's see we could do date and then have the condition to be greater than a specific date let's try that that would look as follows the request dot date greater than or equal to date time dot now dot at hours 24 so it should be greater than 24 hours into the future with message if it's the condition was not met the condition this message will be visible what i have left to do is um pick up all these abstract validators you can do that in the program cs or in your yeah, configure services so register that on our services to find all the abstract validators and for that we need fluent validation ASP.NET core ASP.NET core add that to our API so let's test that out Let's take a look at the weather forecast request. I made the summary not nullable and the date is actually what we're going to test. So let's try. So now we see another formatted, well formatted result. Bad request 400 trace ID. Okay. And then errors date must be at least 24 hours in the future. This is the message coming from the abstract validator, which uh, this validation happens before we actually get into the method. Let's see, because in the method we also have this validation, so we could throw this away. Just say return. We run that and you'll see the message will still be there. The validation kicks in uh, before it enters the action method. Or, uh, uh, let's try it again and we get the same message. That's thanks to this validation error handling. And if we were to have multiple errors, then it's going to also be nicely formatted. So summary is required. So I just left it out of the request body. So that's cool. That's uh, yeah, default behavior. We could specify them, um, change the message. I'm now going to head over to the front end and the Blazor WebAssembly project and try to i'll make a form i try to trigger the same uh, validation error with the form and then of course i could also prove it prove that the validation error would trigger by doing http call from blazor to the api but i might not uh, go all the way that's just gonna work the same as with the swagger. Okay, so I cleared out the index page of the Blazor WebAssembly. I pasted this form. This form has a model of type the weather forecast request. I'll resolve that in a bit. Um, on valid submit, it will then it will trigger this method, which does nothing. Then we have this white fluent validation validator, uh, which yeah, we haven't installed the package yet. And then validation summary, which should show the 
validation errors when there are some. Let's see. Let's put it at the bottom. Uh, the date input date is gonna be give us a date picker. Input number for the oops. The it's gonna be temperature C something. Uh, okay. And then let's first install that Blazor Red. Let's see, Blazor Red Fluent Validation. I hope it's this one. Let's install that. And then we could either at the top at the using statement, but I'm going to do it in the imports and just put it underneath Blazor Red Fluent Validation which should, yeah, now we have the Fluent Validator. All we have left to do is resolve this, but this request object currently resides in the API project and we don't want to add a the reference to the backend project and to the frontend project. So we're going to cut that out, move that to a separate class library, and then both the API and the frontend Blazor app can reference that class library to access this request object. And that's actually really cool because we can now reuse our DTOs, our data transfer objects, our request object class. And we can also use our validation rules. That's two birds with one stone. Okay, so quickly add projects. I'm going to call the class library. I'm gonna call it rules dot and an underscore common because I like that to be to stay at the top. And my file structure, I'm gonna add one directory contracts and then move weather forecasts to the contracts folder. Adjust the namespaces. Let's get rid of this empty class. Okay, so now I seem to have a. Oh, yeah, okay, now this one has to have the fluent installed, fluent validation. I'm going to move it out. I'm going to put it in the CS project of this one. Oops. Like that. Now it's installed. This should be fine. Okay. Now the API gives me errors. Uh, add project reference to the common. Yeah. Let's see if we can resolve these. Yep. Okay. Get rid of the errors. I shouldn't be bothering you with these. Okay, resolved everything. Let's add the project reference to the common to get those DTOs, request objects. And then we should be able to implement this and move that to the imports. Just, yep, like that. And uh, let's run that. Uh, the blazer is running. Let's try it out. I'm going to pick today and we instantly get that validation error. That's great. That's it for the demo. Uh, I showed you how to create your custom validators, how to uh, make sure that the global exception handling also 
formats these kind of validation exceptions nicely to the consumer using fluent validation and then i showed you how to reuse that same validator and the dto in a front-end project on blazor and yeah have the same validation rules let me know what you think about this that you can reuse code in, both in the front as in the back end i think it's really cool um yeah excellent for full stack .NET development in C-sharp. If this video brought any value to you, hit that like button and subscribe. We're halfway to 100 videos, so stay well informed.